nothing lacking nothing missing nothing broken beautiful and wonderful a place which had everything that man would ever need in total abundance that's the kind of life that's the that's what garden of eden represented and that is the kind of life that god has for you and for me today yes that is panted for the water so so long it after the you alone are my heart desire and i long to worship thee as the dear as the dear The water is so much, so long it has to be So long is after you, Lord You alone You alone You alone We long to worship you Mark chapter 11 verse 23 For assuredly I say to you whoever says to this mountain be removed and be cast into the sea does not doubt in his heart but believes that those those things he says will be done he will have whatever he says As believers we have authority and unless you understand this authority that believers have or uh, this authority that we have as believers you cannot really exercise faith so faith and authority goes together if you have faith you will say to the mountain mountain like problems of your life that's what it means many people doubt whether jesus ever said anything like this because this seems like it's so impossible how can you tell the mountain to get lost and how can how would a mountain be gone just because you said so some even say jesus would have never said it this is the cut and paste job somebody has done it they have brought something from somewhere and put it in here inserted here this could not be the words of jesus but there is every every kind of evidence in the bible that this is these are the words of jesus i showed you from the context of the gospel of mark 
that Jesus was teaching faith and the entire teaching on faith there is the kind of faith that believes that God can do the impossible. That's the whole point of the gospel of Mark and the teaching of faith that goes on in the first 10 chapters. 10 times there are narratives that tell us a story of faith, a healing or some miracle or something that happened. And it's all about doing the impossible if you read it. And as a climax only in 11th chapter, he says this. And after this, there's not much teaching about faith. Faith is hardly mentioned there. So faith is kind of a theme in the Gospel of Mark. Apart from that, you will find the Bible teaches faith even in the Old Testament. For example, God speaks and says about Zerubbabel, the man who was appointed to carry out the work of the rebuilding of the temple. And he's trying to do his job amidst a lot of problems, a lot of oppositions, opposing forces around him. Everybody says it's impossible. You can't get it done. And God says, this is a certificate that God gives, literally. He says, oh, big mountain. This is how God speaks to the mountain-like problems that he was facing. He says, oh, big mountain, who are you before Zerubbabel? He will make you level. He will level you, make you plain. <laughs> he will reduce you to nothing. That's what God says. And he will bring the chief stone and they will rejoice saying, grace to it, grace to it. In other words, the job will be completed and there will be an opening of the temple. People will rejoice that God's grace has been there from the beginning to the end. God certifies it. In another place, God says that he has given to us sharp teeth so that we can take the mountains of our life and with our teeth make them into powder. Have you ever read that? Interesting statement. God says, I've given you sharp teeth. In other words, he's talking about how by faith and by our mouth and by what we say, we will take the mountain-like problems of our, of our life and make them into powder. <laughs> the Bible talks about it. So the mountain idea is not a new idea. It's not something that just occurred to Jesus all of a sudden and he just made a statement that was a mistake, you know. No, this, these are statements that have been made in the Old Testament. God saying to the mountain that this man will level you, you're nothing. God saying that people will make the mountain into powder, that idea is there. And so Jesus takes it up in the New Testament and he says, Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but believe that whatever he says shall come to pass. He shall have whatever he says. Amazing, wonderful statement. We don't want to preach a nice sermon over that statement. We have gone to why this is possible. I showed you that man has been given authority over everything. That he is a Lord over everything, literally. He is a God with a little g. Let me remind you, it's a little g. If you think big g, then you've gone crazy. <laughs> it's God with a little g because, not because he's God, but because he's made in the image and likeness of God and therefore he's a ruler over all of God's creation. The Bible says all things are subjected to him. God has crowned him with glory, on, glory and honor and subjected everything and put everything under his feet. How much of it is put under his feet? The Bible comments on it. New Testament says in Hebrews 2, 9, that so that nothing was left out. Everything was put under his feet. This is a statement Bible makes, not me. Everything, nothing left out, is brought under man's authority. This is the kind of authority man has been given. And so man has authority. Man is not an ordinary person. Man, in living in this body, in this world, it's not just dust and worm, you know, like some Christians think. Man is made in the image and likeness of God. He carries an authority that is equal to none. Only God is above him. Everything is under him. But something happened to this man. He fell. And as a result of the fall, certain things, consequences happened. And last week we talked about it and I brought you to a point where I told you that in the fall, one of the key things is 
that something went wrong with the mouth of man and the heart of man and the mind of man at the fall. When man fell, his heart got disconnected from God, his spirit got disconnected from God. And I say spirit, it includes this, the heart and the mind of man. You say man is spirit, soul and body. Soul is the mind. Spirit is the heart. Body, right? So the heart got, the spirit got disconnected from God and the mind got disconnected from God. Now, the tongue which was before connected to a heart that was in fellowship with God is now connected to a heart that has been darkened, a mind that has been darkened and connected to the devil. Now, this is the problem. Now let's continue that. Go back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has indeed, has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now I want to stop right here and explain a very important thing. How Satan operates. Something great is revealed here. What Satan is all about. Because Christian people think Satan is all about witchcraft. And uh, all this hex and spell and all of these things, you know. Uh, they think Satan only operates in that way. When Christians talk about devil and his work, they think only in those terms. Wrong. The devil operates in more subtle ways. He's a subtle devil. <laughs> he, he won't come with a tail and two horns as a black something before you. No. He won't come as, because you know it's the devil. If he comes like that. And you'll drive him off in a minute in Jesus' name. So when he comes to the believers, he doesn't come like that because he knows that you know. So he's a very subtle devil. He knows how to come, how to operate. And uh, believers don't realize that he's there and he's operating many times. He comes with suggestions. The suggestions may come by various means. A man may say, a woman may say it. A person known to you may say it. A preacher may say it. A relative may say it. But behind that suggestion is the devil. Jesus identified that. One time Peter was telling Jesus, No Lord, don't talk about the cross. The cross is not for you. Don't die. No, 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 no. Let not these things come out of your, of your mouth, he says. Jesus identified who was talking. It's not Peter. It's the devil. So Jesus looked at him and said, Get thee behind me, Satan. Talking to Peter, he said, Get thee behind me, Satan. Now, I'm not telling you to go and call everybody Satan who talks anything that you don't like. Please don't do that and blame it on me. I have enough things coming at me. <laughs> I don't need this thing. What I'm saying is, the devil comes in so many ways, through people, through suggestions, through various ways, you may be hearing something from some unknown person and he may be saying, and it may be a thing that he is uh, saying, which the devil uses to suggest to you and drop in a seed into your heart to ruin your heart and your desire for God. Look at what the devil does. He says, he comes and God told Adam and Eve, you can eat of all the uh, fruit of all the trees of the garden, except this one tree of which you cannot eat. The day you eat, you'll surely die. And the devil comes and puts it like this. He says, as God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. He puts it exactly the opposite. He says, the, the whole purpose, it looks, it's very deliberate. The whole purpose is to make it appear as though God is a hard, hard person. That he's got this Wonderful big garden, so many trees, but he doesn't want you to even touch one. He doesn't want you to even enjoy a few fruit from there. He doesn't want you to have the good life. He doesn't want you to have anything from this place. All the good things that he has created, you should not enjoy. You should not have. Now, I hear that suggestion coming from so many quarters. All the time. I've heard it all my life. 
lot of people say things like that they say things like we don't need luxury i asked the man what do you mean luxury what do you mean luxury i remember my father buying a fridge i think i've told you this a second hand one in those days everything was bought second hand because you can't buy anything new so a missionary was going out back to his country he sold a big fridge that was like 15 years or 20 years old i don't know how old it was already rusted off and all that for a few hundred rupees and my father picked it up and we brought it in a big you know vehicle and a huge fridge and we brought it in i remember a few preachers standing there friends of my father said this is world the world coming in a spiritual man is turning into worldly man look at this a refrigerator now those people are still alive and uh, i know those people have nice fridge in their house none of them without is without a refrigerator in their house they all have their refrigerator but at that time you couldn't blame them they are victims of this circumstance you know it was a time when nobody had a refrigerator in their house you know i remember a time when in our house we didn't have a refrigerator when i was little and i remember the time when my father bought the first refrigerator you know so they were all, we are all kind of uh, victims of this uh, this kind of society in which we are brought up and the circumstances of our life and so on so it was thought that a refrigerator was luxury and uh, so these people said it's worldly now everyone has got a refrigerator i asked one guy actually remember we all believed that refrigerator is very worldly and my father got a refrigerator everybody looked at it kind of critically you know that he's got a refrigerator but you all have a refrigerator now and the man coolly says that was that period i said thank god man i didn't believe you and my father didn't believe you we had never had a refrigerator he said that's that period and we were it's an we didn't know he said in tamil ariyada kalam so that's the period we didn't know these things so we thought it was a luxury but now we don't think so because we got it if they get it it's all right if they get it and we get it it's all right if they don't have it and we have it it's a luxury that's the definition of luxury nothing else i remember buying a maruti 800 car Maruti, when I first came and started ministry here, I bought a Maruti 800 car. That's the time that it came out. Boy, that I think uh, for all our people here, it looked like it was the greatest luxurious car in the whole world. Because we were used to just the old ambassador and so on uh, running everywhere. And all of a sudden, these pretty little Japanese cars are running around town. Everybody thought, oh, it's so pretty, so nice. And I bought a little... Maruti 800, nice silver gray and all that. And uh, some people believed that was luxury. Boy, that's luxury. Now, I traveled all over Tamil Nadu. Myself and Pastor John Abraham traveled all over Tamil Nadu, went into the mountains and hills and places that you can't go. In fact, the service people were asking me where I was driving this car. It was all the bearing is gone. It's all mud and, you know. we were driving everywhere preaching all over tamil nadu and andhra pradesh and all these places with this little car and they were calling it luxury and i wouldn't call it luxury my back was aching you know it was very bad travel but it was the best car you can get some line nice little car you can't blame the car it's just little car you can't, it can't provide any big luxury to you it's a little car and it's not very safe for anything because it's little but that's all you had and that's all i had and a lot of people didn't have it and so this fellow said this is luxury this is luxury but those very same people have better cars than maruti 800 today so it's all a perspective problem what can kind a of time period in which we live what is our circumstances how we view things and all of those things so i thank god that i don't have to go by somebody's measurement of what luxury is and what uh, is acceptable and what is not acceptable i prefer to go by god's word what can you have what can you not have 
let's go to the word of god when god made man and woman and put them in this world he didn't say just water once in two days is enough for you he didn't say a little apartment 650 square feet is enough for you he made a beautiful garden put everything in it much more than man would ever need four rivers one to bathe in one to wash in another word to take a swim in if he wants to i don't know what four rivers are for as many christians will object to today that this is luxury why are you wasting but that is not a waste to god that's god he's god you can't talk like a man to god god is god he's all able it's nothing for him in his perspective this is nothing so it's better in life to get god's perspective when you get god's perspective then you look at things in god's perspective you don't look at things like a mere man in this world living in a particular culture living in a particular country living in a particular background and circumstance and so on you begin to get god's perspective and god's perspective is the healthiest perspective that you can have because then you can have and enjoy everything that god wants you to have otherwise your culture itself will hamper your progress and stand in the way of your development and enjoyment of all the good things that god has made for you it is important to get the perspective of that god has what kind of a life that god wants us to have god wants us to have the garden of eden kind of life he has no second plan he has no other plans god then and now has only the garden of eden in mind that is when that is why when the man sinned man was sent out of the garden of eden but god was in the work of redemption trying to bring him back into the garden of eden that is why during the people of israel's days in egypt when they were in slavery suffering in poverty and want and nothingness they were trampled upon ill treated god goes out to them and says come i will take you out of this land and take you to a land that is flowing with milk and honey a large and vast land flowing with milk and honey the bible says he went and prepared it for them of all the good lands that were available he chose one a very wonderful land and blessed that land with everything and prepared it for them and then took the people of israel and took them in there to live in those houses and eat out of the vineyards and to drink out of those waters so again a garden of eden god takes them into a garden of eden only garden of eden kind of life all the way from slavery into a garden of eden kind of life and in the end when we go to heaven don't be surprised if it's very much like the garden of eden if you read the first two chapters and then read the last two chapters of the bible look at the similarity heaven is just like the garden of eden because god has nothing in mind other than the garden of eden and the life that it represented the garden of eden represented a particular kind of life everything in abundance nothing lacking nothing missing nothing broken beautiful and wonderful a place which had everything that man would ever need in total abundance that's the kind of life that's the that's what garden of eden represented and that is the kind of life that god has for you and for me today good and your mercy endure forever Lord you are good and your mercy endure forever People from every nation and time from generation to generation worship you Hallelujah Hallelujah we Thank you. 
Oh uh-huh. 